from two things specifically. Uh, I was having this conversation with Alan about his work and about Jim's work and the curatorial idea that I want to bring to this is comparing two different visual languages. Uh, Alan's work is something that is in this tradition, this European tradition, I would say an operatic or romantic tradition. Uh, they, are, they almost hit you over the head with the drama, you know, these women, and they have these kind of intense looks on their face, and the, as I already said, the, the layers of kind of reference that are in these works. That's very different than what Jim does. Jim's visual language is based on a consumer kind of aesthetic, something that's bright and shiny, and for that makes you kind of want it or be interested in it. And it uses strategies of marketing too. Um, of course, that Jim is very familiar with, uh, you know, because of his history in advertising. I, I have, to be honest, I, I turned to a career of, um, from selling things that people don't need in advertising to making things that people don't want in art because it helped me deal with some very severe illnesses mm -hmm. that I had in my life because I did not want to go to my grave and have my tombstone say, here lies the guy that did the Monos commercial. Mm -hmm. I always believe you have to laugh mm -hmm. at bad things. Mm -hmm. Bad things don't mind being called bad things they don't like being laughed at. At the outbreak of World War I, over 35,000 German university and technical college students all hopped up in nationalism volunteered for the army. 25,000 of these student volunteers were killed. It became known as the Kindermorn B. Yepern. That's German for the massacre of innocents at Ypres. One German survivor of the battle said, quote, the men were too young and the officers too old. Your work uses a lot of toys and objects that look commercially produced. Could you explain why you do this? Because um, toys are really easy and fun to buy. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I like toys. Okay. I think now I think uh, toys, toys, simplify a subject and also add dimension to it at the same time. Mm -hmm. If something so simple as a toy can tell a story, <clears throat> mm -hmm. then you know that's why I like to use them. Jim Riswold's Kim Jong-il is a big sucker in Five Flavors, Tropical Fruits, and Jolly Ranchers is part of a larger series of works called Bad People Have to Eat Too, all which focus on dictators um, such as, you know, Hitler, Stalin. I believe there's a Mussolini, there's definitely a small Caesar salad, large Caesar salad. They're all these simple kind of punchy jokes, essentially, where he takes um, a kind of all-pervasive you know, dictator, dictators control um, the way the public and their countries understand their personality and their identity. And he kind of makes a joke out of it. So in this case, Kim Jong-il, the dear leader, the ultimate supreme leader of North Korea becomes a big sucker, you know, and then that joke continues by uh, making it five flavors or Jolly Rancher or tropical fruits. Um, and in doing this, Jim takes away the kind of power, that all controlling, you know, that the kind of propagandistic power that um, Kim Jong-il or say, Mao, um, you know, has, and how figures like this retain this power is through propaganda and media. So Jim actually uses um, strategies of advertising because that's what he knows, um, and he kind of again subverts that power um, by making lollipops and cakes and, and such out of them. Uh, why is painting important to you? I, actually, I've never known anything else because I, even like when I was six years old, uh, you know, my mother kept my drawings, mm -hmm. and I remember the teacher putting one of my paintings on the wall, which that's a painting of a black dog with a red collar. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, when I was nine years old, you know, my mother's friends had art collections. I saw Japanese prints and stuff. They would tell me about the relationship between Japanese art and the Impressionists. You know, the art teacher at school, and I'm, I'm like nine years old and stuff, you know, who introduced me. I mean, I think because I had a kind of maybe a greater interest. I had a, I don't know why, I really loved minimal art. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember seeing a book on Barnett Newman and going, this is great, you know, painting with one line on it. I just thought this was incredible. And I remember seeing the same thing, a book of Ellsworth Kelly, uh -huh. and just being totally blown away by, you know, the, the kind of directness of it and the simplicity of it. But I also knew that, that I had to do something different. So this painting of Alan's, his interpretation of Bathsheba, uh, he uses um, a model, but the way he paints her, I see in this, um, both the shoulders are down, there's a sense of resignation, you know, it's that awareness of what she has to do, um, but yet in her eyes, somewhere in herself, there is some resilience, you know, she's going to be strong, she's going to do what she has to do, and she's going to survive, so it's this really interesting psychological moment, and that's what I think Alan brings to his painting, these really interesting psychological moments. Moments. Um, now, on another note, uh, you know, he is looking at Caravaggio. If you look at the lighting, the dramatic space, the, the austere background, um, this is very Caravaggesque. Uh, and then also the background is so simple um, with that kind of uh, linearity. It almost is like a minimalist painting. So there's all of these kind of references to other artists that are informing Al, not just in style, but trying to kind of harness some of the drama too. So every one of Alan's works has a similar kind of multi-dimensionality to it um, and I think that that's what really makes him outstanding as an artist. I had a girlfriend who was an expert in kimono and I painted her a couple of times and she said to me, why don't you paint a woman in kimono? And I said, the same, well, I just said to you, I said, I have no interest. And she said, no, no, you can do it, you can do it. So I went, okay. So I, I, so I began to paint Japanese women in kimono. Okay. And I actually met Kanako at a fashion party and she was a fashion model that specialized in modeling kimono and, and Japanese traditional accessories. How do you think your style has changed from the first paintings of Kanako in the yes. early 90s, mid 90s, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then to this one that's 2007? Well, as I said, um, I took up the piano in 1999 mm -hmm. and it was deliberately to make my work more fluid because mm -hmm. you appreciate on the piano you have to hit the right notes but at the same time as hitting the right notes you have to have a sense of fluidity in playing the music mm -hmm. so it doesn't look as though you're trying right. and that hugely influenced the way I, I my painting developed because I got more confident. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a precedence, I guess, that informed my decision or informed this title of SmackDown. Um, but it's the idea that it's an opportunity to identify two different visual languages. Um, and it's also playful and fun, you know, and, and Jim and Alan have a little bit of a history. They know each other uh, from the past exhibit when I brought Alan over um, two years ago. And, you know, there was always a sort of sparring there that I thought would be a, a, good, a good pairing. <laughs>